All right, here we go, guys. Episode uh, 13 of the C-Squared podcast. Uh, Fabi, how's your week been? I just got back home, so it's uh, good to be back. Settle down a bit after a busy weekend, seeing family. Besides that, not much else, you know, just following the, the chess world, what's going on. Where were uh, you for uh, Thanksgiving? Because you oh, were I, saying I, that you were with family, but you never gave the location. Now that you're out of the location, I think it's safe to give at, at least the state or the city. Where yeah, no, Florida, Florida. I mean, uh, I guess it's fine to give the state. Yeah, you know, you never know what people will do these days. <laughs> yeah, that's but, true. Uh, I guess Florida is vague enough. Yep, yep, Florida. Uh, how's the weather there, by the way? I was in Massachusetts, and I have to say it was pretty chilly, but I, I'm definitely a guy that enjoys um, the chilly weather during the winter months. How about you? I really like the Florida weather in the winter. In the summer, it's, it's a bit extreme, especially with the humidity. But in the winter, it's like, I mean, that, when I was there, it was around 75, hovering between 70 and 75, which is really comfortable. That's really and, nice. Uh, yeah, now now in St. Louis, it's closer to freezing. It's not too cold, but it's uh, it definitely feels like winter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, St. Louis, uh, I'm not 100% sure how the weather is in St. Louis, but I would assume it's pretty similar to what we have here in uh, Colombia. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a good, uh, good week, definitely a good time to spend with the family and you know, forget about the worries, forget about the deadlines and things of that nature. But I have to say, it's uh, good to be back, good to get back into some sort of a routine, mm -hmm. good to, uh, you know, catch up with whatever work I had, university and get back uh, on in the same state as, as, as you and uh, maybe connect soon. Because I'm coming to St. Louis in a couple of days. Yeah. for uh, the gala and we actually have some fun things planned out for that weekend and actually also the upcoming uh, weekend after that so it's going to be uh, an eventful couple of weeks i have to say yeah, the, the, the gala is interesting that. yeah it's uh it's going to so judith polgar will be inducted into the world chess hall of fame from what i understand i just found out about that yeah which uh, is it the it's the World Chess Hall of Fame, not the U United States Chess Hall of Fame, right? The World Chess Hall of Fame, and yeah, she was supposed so. to be inducted at the beginning of the U.S. Championship, but mm -hmm. she was unable to make it. And I think that's when uh, Eugene Torre got inducted. And yeah, it was uh, a few. So uh, Eugenio Torre, uh, James Tarjan, American Grandmaster, um, and he was inducted in uh, the American Hall of Fame, the U.S. Hall of Fame. Ah, uh, yeah, and and the last, from what I remember. Um, was Miguel uh, no, but from uh, from Living People. I'm blanking. I'm blanking right Me now. Too. I, I shouldn't be because actually I, I love the guy's books. Um, Is he an American? Yeah, yeah. He's a great author. He's an international master. Oh yeah, John Donaldson was it? No, 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 no. But he he spoke also. John Donaldson spoke. I think he was uh, praising Eugene Torre, if I'm not mistaken, or James Tarjan. Oh yes, I remember. Uh, I remember. John Watson. Watson. John Watson. Yes, Watson. yes, yes. I remember. So he, he was one of my favorite chess authors growing up. He, yeah. he wrote, this was quite a, quite a while ago. I mean, like the early 2000s, late 90s, I think, that he wrote a bunch of books, mostly about modern trends in, uh, in chess. And I remember being very interested in, like, it was just, just content. Like mm -hmm. this game featuring a modern idea. It's all like top level games and analyzed. Of course, this was pre-strong computer times your computers were rather weak so most of the the bulk of the work i, I think he did it on his own you know for an, an analytical work he did on his own so that was in the, like the heyday of chess books you know now it's all online with super strong engines and people get a bit spoiled but back in the day these were this was the way that you learned from chess and i remember classic chess books. the first time i saw him i think it was during a uh, gibraltar open 2014 or 2015 and um i had no idea about who he is but mm -hmm. i believe the first or second round he just destroyed gawain jones in like this crazy game and i was like wait this guy can play i mean who is this yeah, guy? yeah he's I a started... good player yeah yeah international i mean he would have been grandmaster in in today's times you think so uh, yeah, I mean, the international master title was worth more than when he got it. I assume it was in like the 70s yep. than, than now. Actually, when when did he become international master? I'm kind of curious. Mm. I would guess sometime in the 70s. I would, um, yeah, I would assume so. 
70s but, and 80s? You know, I, I, yeah, maybe. I, I have a small story. Mm -hmm. um, so you remember the Internet Chess Club, the ICC? Of which course, the famous it still It still exists, but it's not very popular because, you know, chess.com, chess Somehow chess people stopped uh, playing there. They stopped innovating, it seems like, right? And just allowed chess.com yeah. and chess24 to kind of take over. Which yeah, they had a corner. Because everybody mm -hmm. super strong was playing on that website. Yeah, they had a corner on the market. They were the best place. I mean, it was like play chess and the ICC. But the ICC had Nakamura playing regularly, uh, Gadakamski playing regularly, Mamadiaro, Kazimjot, like all these super strong players, uh, top players in the world. Grishuk, I remember, was a huge. I, I played many times against Grishuk then. When I was, you know, when Grishuk was a superstar, still isn't, and, and I was, you know, an up and coming player, so I wasn't at the level of these guys. And also, like Kamsky attributed a lot of American chess player success to being able to play against him because he's. You know, he was already top player in the world while like Nakamura was was trying to improve and uh, and was still very young. And so he was saying that like all these players benefited a lot from being able to train and play chess against against him, against Gata. Uh But when I was a kid, which is a very 14, humble thing to say, of course. Yeah, but, you know, from <laughs> typical Gata, who, from the famous. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, he, he probably has a point as well uh, because, of course, it is good practice. But when I was young, I um, was actually kind of interviewed by John Watson. I don't know if interviewed is the right way, but right uh, way to say it. But um, I just showed a few of my games, and I was like 14, so these were very early games, and went through them with with uh, John on um, on the ICC, and he, we recorded some sort of video. I don't know if that video is still in existence, uh, but yeah, that was I, I still have a memory of that, and I even remember one of the games I showed him, which is in the databases. But yeah, that that was a good memory. It was like a two-hour-long thing that we did. Yeah, uh, you know, normally young players don't get much attention, so it was of course quite valuable that uh, you know he looked over some of my games and gave me some you know some publicity, some exposure. Yep. No, so that's uh, getting back to Judith and her coming to St. Louis. Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw Judith. It probably was, in fact, in 2016. I mean, obviously, I'm following whenever she does any sort of broadcasts, but I think it was in 2016 when I actually met her in New York for uh, the mm -hmm. World Championship match between uh, Magnus and Karyakin. So that was a good time. I was acting like a fanboy, obviously one of, uh, well, the strongest female player to ever play the game, uh, a mm -hmm. legend in uh, in her own, and uh, hopefully we will be able to actually connect with her uh, during the gala. So that's going to yeah, be Yeah, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing her in New York for the World Championship match that you mentioned. Ah, the same one, yeah. The same one between Magnus and, and Sergei Karyakin. Yeah. And then I saw her at the 2018 candidate. She was there for a bit. She was at Norway Chess also a few times, so I, I think maybe the last time I saw her might have been but, you know, it was probably something more recently. I can't remember exactly. Oh, no, she was at the candidates this year. Really? She was at, at the closing ceremony of the candidates, so I saw her there. Okay. Because, you know, she's very much into... Um, well, she has chess, her own not, foundation, I think. Yeah, yeah, chess, but not in the chess playing sense. She retired in 2014 from professional chess playing, but she's still very active in the chess scene. Well, right now she's pretty much becoming one of the best commentators out there. Obviously, she's uh, gathering a lot of fans with her style and her knowledge. I mean, she's so knowledgeable um, and such a good player. So, yeah, definitely excited to uh, see uh, Judith. Who else is going to be at the gala? I guess that's... Oh, I, I think a lot of people we know. Players. Yeah. Levon, for example, will be there. Yeah. We're sense. connecting with Levon. Hopefully, we'll be able to get him on the podcast. That should be interesting. Yeah, yeah that'll be good. Uh, and a lot of, I mean, you know, St. Louis is home to many grandmasters, so I would assume the university players. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm bringing a couple the, of players from my university. Yeah, with from me. Mizzou, from St. Louis University, probably from Webster, and other grandmasters or, or other chess players who are in, in town will probably be there. So Yeah, it's always a good, uh, good time at the gala. Always mm -hmm. a fun way to pretty much end uh, the St. Louis Chess Club year, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. We are involved with the club quite often and we spend a lot of time in St. Louis, but it's nice to have uh, this type of conclusion at the end of the year and obviously also raise funds for uh, worthy causes. So yeah, that's going to be a fun one. What else uh, has been happening? Well, we were 
speaking about Levon, and he actually won a very exciting uh, match in the Speed Chess Championship against uh, Le- uh, not against Levon Aronian, against uh, Dmitry <laughs> Andrekin. That was a super fun one. Let's talk about that a little bit, and I'm sure we'll talk with Levon as well. But I have to say, I think if I remember correctly, they went into the final Armageddon Blitz match or something along those lines, uh, tight, 14-14. Yeah, so it wasn't Armageddon, but they so the last Andrekin was was leading the uh, the match for the majority of it, and the five minute and the three minute he had a, he had a pretty big lead going into bullet. So I in the five like... minute he actually uh, Levon won five four, and then um, Andrekin came back six two. He won in the three plus. Yeah, one. he had a three point lead going into bullet yeah. ten to seven, right? Yeah, and then Levon won by a three point margin in bullet. Yes, four it was margin. A bit... No, three point margin. Four he's point. down. He won eight four. I don't think. I think in the so bullet, he was down three points, and in the bullet he won eight four. Well, that's including the tiebreaker because they went, they went to a tie, which mm-hmm. which means that they played an additional four games. Uh huh. Okay. At the end of the match, but like the actual bullet portion, like when the time ended, when the match clock ended, was tied. Got it. And then they then they played an additional four, which he won by two and a half, one and a half. Yes. Which is the system. If he went into the last game needing to win, he was down a point with like a minute to go in the match clock. So he it was a must win. That was gonna be the last game. And he won that. He brought it to the uh tiebreaker. He won that two and a half, one and a half. The last game I, I was watching live, it was completely insane. Back and forth. I mean, Andrega made a huge blunder. Like he he could have won an exchange, but he just like blundered his entire king side instead. Instead of winning an exchange, he lost two points for nothing. Yeah, uh, he just missed like one simple move, and I saw his reaction. It was like utter disbelief when it when he saw that the h4 pawn could be taken. And yeah, then but then it, in the final position it was a draw. He ran out of time. It was still an objectively a draw. Was it really a draw? Yeah, yeah. The, I'm trying to I remember the, the position, and I thought he was winning. I thought um, that one was, was winning in like winning. a million ways throughout. Like he could have won twenty times over. I mean. It was completely winning, but in the final position, it was getting out of control. They were both almost flagging both of them. Uh, he was like missing very, very easy ways to promote his H pawn, and then suddenly, the eval bar showed like that Black could make a draw, that Andrekin can make a draw, and uh, and at that exact moment, he flagged. Wow! So, and that was the end of the match. It was it was a very wild match, very dramatic. Yep, yep, yep. So that's a big win for Levon after uh, a pretty difficult period for him. He's been struggling in classical chess, but obviously still a force to be reckoned with. And right now that's paving the way for a huge quarterfinal between him and uh, Hikaru. That's going to be an interesting one. He plays Hikaru, right? He plays that's Hikaru, yeah. yeah. He's one of the players I would think has, if he's on good, on good form, has a legitimate chance against Hikaru. Of course, we have to say Hikaru should be the favorite, but... If Levon's in good form, uh, he's not intimidated by Hikaru at all. He he can play objectively better chess. Uh, you know, he's he's just not as consistent as Hikaru is. Like Hikaru, almost always pre- performs well to to godlike. So that's that's his. While Levon performs godlike at times, like Hikaru, but can also perform very very much below par. So that's the only thing which separates them in in this format. Yeah, obviously, Hikaru, uh, huge consistency, yeah. especially in the quicker time controls. I do believe that Levon has an edge in the classical time control, but that's obviously completely different than... I'm not sure, but it, yeah, yeah, I think like 60-40 Hikaru 60, 40. is a fair, yeah. a fair uh, assessment. I will give I, him 70-30, actually. I think Hikaru, you think so? That yeah, much? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think Hikaru is a pretty serious favorite. Like, Andrekin is, is incredibly strong, and he dominated him in bullet. Um, Andrekin and Hikaru have played matches that haven't been clear-cut, you know? But that's the um, thing. I think in the bullet portion is where Hikaru is going to make his... That's uh, exactly where he stamp. dominated Andrekin. Exactly. I mean, Levon, Levon and bullet was so good. And when I played Hikaru, I mean, I don't know if this is a very representative match. I lost the match, but the bullet was tied. And he actually outperformed me significantly in the five minute. Okay. Uh, so, you know, these things are never, of course, Hikaru won the match. So maybe in bullet, he didn't really care so much. He just needed to keep his lead. But these things are never predictable. Levon could play amazingly in bullet. Hikaru could 
could play amazingly in five or three minutes. Like none of this is clear cut to me. No, absolutely. And I have to say the speed chess championship matches have been extremely, extremely exciting so far. Obviously your match uh, was a lot of fun to watch. This one was just simply ridiculous. Um, wait, actually, we said that Hikaru is going to play Aronian, but I don't think Hikaru actually oh, yeah. played okay, this yeah, we're, <laughs> oh, okay. Hikaru is playing Paravian. We, um, we gave Hikaru the win against Paravian. Okay, okay, but we give him like a solid 90% against Paravian, right? I, I really? Saying. Only 90%? I mean, look, you gave Magnus against Gukesh like 99 point something percent. No, I gave him 95. I mean, let's. I, I said 95. 95%. Okay, and we have to give Hikaru at least the same. You think at least what? At least the same. I mean, Parbian is much more experienced online than Gukesh. But he's not the stronger player. No, Gukesh is a better player, but uh, but this is not classical chess, you know? That's true. Um, I don't, I mean, Gukesh has no experience online. That's kind of a big part of it, especially in Bullet, mm -hmm. where Magnus plays very constantly. And Magnus has played like 30 second matches against An Andrew Tang. I mean, like he he's not just an exceptional player he also understands the format very well these are additional perks mm -hmm. uh while parbiana he's a he's a very seasoned online player you know he's played rapid chess championships successfully uh tile tuesday successfully so but still yeah i mean hikaru of course of course is a huge favor <laughs> like we can't we cannot deny that yeah, yeah, it's hard to argue against that. Yep, I agree. And then uh, Dingley ran also crazy match against uh, Grishuk. Grishuk almost came back. Uh, I think Dingley ran had a pretty significant lead, uh, and then uh, Grishuk managed to cut that to one point. In the end, it was uh, Dingley ran that won it by two points. So that was yeah, it was very close because very also Grishuk well. disconnected in one game. He, he lost his connection. Okay. Yeah, it was very costly in one minute game. Wow. Uh, I, I don't. It might not have changed the match, but it still, you know, it changes things for sure. Yeah. So, so far, Speed Chess Championship has oh, by the way, delivering. About the Speed Chess Championship, also, Maxime beat Jan by like a six or seven point margin. Dominated. Something like that. Yeah. And I, I saw the community prediction beforehand. It was like 80% for Jan. And I was thinking, this is like insane. I mean, the guy, Maxime, beat Magnus. Do you remember who you matches. picked? during our previous podcast. So I'm trying to I said remember 50, my I said practice. pure 50-50 for that one. What did I say? I want to say I picked Maxim, but obviously I'm We have the I'm receipts. way off. We, we yeah. do have the receipts. We will have to get back um, and check the tape. But yes, Speed Chess Championship, a lot of fun and uh, a lot more fun matches to come. Now, mm -hmm. what else has been happening? We have the Tata Steel Rapid which uh, actually just concluded and Nihal Sarin, I didn't see this one coming, has uh, pretty much dominated the event. He won it with six and a half points out of... Okay, dominated, uh, I wouldn't go so far. He won by a half point margin yes, against Eric, over yes, Eric Icy. Yes, that's true. But uh, the third placement is four and a half points. Yeah, this was weird. It was a, it was a tale of two players. It yes. was Nihal and Eric Icy, Arjun. Yes. You know, like... They they both scored. Nobody else scored a plus from what I see. Four and a half, four and a half, four people on four and a half, including Hikaru who was up and down, uh, Abdul Sitarov up and down, Gukesh up and down as well. They actually had the same three wins, three losses, all of them, which is interesting, right? This is super scary. I'm seeing Eragaisi, and I I remember the fact that the guy is 16, 17, something Wait, like that. Eragaisi is 19, right? Is he? No, I thought he's like 16 or 17. I might he's be either 18 or 19, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Aha, uh -huh, so it's Gukesh that is 16. 19. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, Gukesh, okay. Gukesh is 17. Okay, so Gukesh is the younger one. And but Eric also Gukesh Nihal. Is the older I mean, one. Nihal is like... Uh, 18? 17. I think he's already 18. I mean, there's yeah, so many like, of them there. That, and yeah, they're yeah. so good. And they've been good for so many years. That is just so difficult to track keep track of all of them but I, i'm not too surprised i mean nihal who got to the final of the speed chess championship yeah like why is it a surprise he can win this tournament oh no nihal for sure i mean for for, for me nihal is already seasoned like well same with eric Icy. i think that these guys are already they've the thing is like when i was their age you know i would play a top tournament once a year maybe maybe not even once a year and they play 
the Chess 24 tour, like three events in a row against, you know, Magnus, uh, Anish, Mamadiar, like whoever, whoever you can think of, they play. They're already experienced against top players. This experience is like super helpful. They get it very, very quickly. Yeah. What surprised me is Wesley on a minus. That's that's a surprise. Given that Wesley he just on. won uh, the Global Chess Championship in pretty much a very similar time format. So it's just, um, you know, Wesley is like so consistent, consistent stable. Yeah. And he is objectively like one of the favorites. Maybe him, Hikaru. You would put them as favorites, right? In this Absolutely. field. Absolutely. Like traditionally, it would it would be Wesley, Shakriar, Hikaru. All the other guys are young. Vidit is a bit younger, but you wouldn't put him in the same category of strength as those three guys. But we saw a totally different thing. You know, the young guys coming up, Vidit, uh, Vidit solid, uh, Hikaru up and down. Yeah, it's it was an interesting the tournament. And it's funny because Nihal actually lost against Eric Aisi. And then yeah. he didn't lose against anybody else. And Eric Gaisi actually lost against Setu Raman and yeah. didn't lose against anybody else. And Setu Raman actually finished on only two points. He beat Eric yeah. Gaisi, huge result for the standings, and then drew yeah. a couple of games. So, um, yeah. yeah, sometimes it happens. You, you don't, uh, you know, all these guys are good and you don't know where the danger comes from. So for him, it came against the guy who had an objectively very poor performance, but still can play very well. Yeah, yeah, and I think Hikaru also struggled a little bit. I have to say, I did not see this one coming, either. Um, well, he said jet lag. Jet I saw lag. on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, I, I I like hesitate to give excuses because you know, it's your responsibility to be jet lagged or not. These are all physical things that come on the. That's the responsibility of the sports person. Completely um, agree. Yeah. So, yeah, it might be jet lag, but. Who cares? I mean, that's that's your problem. It's, Nobody else it's only the result that stands. Yeah. Uh, so that was definitely a fun event, and I've been watching a little bit of it, not too much, and mostly uh, replays of it. I have to say, the mm -hmm. commentary was very enthusiastic between uh, Sagar Shah and uh, Tanya Sashev. So I've enjoyed that as well. It, it it was a good tournament, and I'm happy to see that a lot more events and hopefully a lot more very strong events are going to be held in uh, india they definitely have the infrastructure well this is right um this is not the end of the event right there's the blitz that follows there's the blitz section yes yes so yeah. i don't think like we say that nihal won but i think that it is combined score which matters in the end so it's combined scored like uh in the grand chess tour you combine the rapid and blitz. i think so like yeah you can count them as separate events but in the end the combined score is what matters mm -hmm. and for example saturman is going out for the rapid uh, for the blitz and pragnanta is going in for the blitz yeah i don't know why they didn't invite pragnanta for but like it sometimes feels a bit weird you know there's these two young players nihal and pragnanta who are more or less the same like level same strength a lot of successes for both of them same age and then they seem to like share uh invitations it seems like pragnanta gets all the chess 24 invitations nihal seems to get some more like over the board in or chess.com invitations or or i guess maybe that's more uh qualification but it's interesting that they didn't buy both of them. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting. Let's talk about the uh, Tata Steel Chess India for uh, the uh, women players as well. And um, I wanted to discuss about that because I think for the first time, uh, we have the same price fund for uh, the oh, really? open section yeah. as well as for uh, the women, women section. So oh, I, think I didn't check the regulations. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What is your take on that? And what do you feel about uh, the final results? I see Ushenina actually won with eight and a half points. I'm still... Yeah, now that's that's a dominant performance. Yes, yes. Although I don't understand. I see it, but it says that she played three games against... I do not Nana understand what... So I, I assume there. that actually they... They tied, and then she won 2-0 in the tiebreak against uh, Nana. That makes sense. That makes that's perfect what, sense. That's what the standings look like to me. That makes perfect sense, yes. Yeah, she won 2-0. Mm. So dominant uh, tiebreak win, and also like the last game was completely dominant. 21 moves, checkmated her, basically. I see it. Yeah, very nice. Actually, prizes are interesting. This is very rare. So like I have slightly mixed feelings about this, because on the one hand, of course, they are significantly lower rated than the than the other section, right? Mm -hmm. From a purely, you know, competitive standpoint, you would think that the higher rated section would have more money. Then again, if they want to encourage 
uh, women to to play and have success. And this is, of course, a good strategy. I saw Gibraltar also had this traditionally, right? They yes. they had like a very, very significant women's prize. And also the women could win two prizes, mm-hmm. which is a bit controversial because normally you can only win one prize in a tournament. And I remember once we fought tied for first. So she picked up the women's prize of like, I don't know how much money it was, but a pretty significant amount, you know, in the in the many thousands, uh, like 20,000. Mm-hmm. And then she also tied for first and got the share of the like 50,000 first prize. So she made some, you know, extraordinary amount of money. But on the other hand, I mean, like the more money that you bring in chess, I, I don't think it's ever a bad thing. And of course, they are professional players. They do need to make a living. So, uh, so they should have good prizes. It's great to see uh, the female players being incentivized to compete, to dedicate uh, their careers to chess, because uh, it is difficult at some point, right, as uh, a woman, whether you're going to decide that you want to pursue your career in which potentially there's not as uh, as many prize funds, you know, as uh, in the open section. So you don't have a clear path as to how to make uh, a good living or to just, you know, um, pursue other avenues, uh, maybe even become a mother, because that's a very important and difficult question that every pretty much uh, woman has to answer at some point in her life, right? Do you want to dedicate yourself to a career or do you want to take that, let's say, gap year and become a mother? And we've actually seen that with a few female players recently, specifically Harika. I think she just uh, gave birth and she was in her uh, ninth ninth month, actually, during the Mm -hmm. Olympiad. And she was still playing um, and representing India. So that was pretty cool to see. Well, that, that's a uh, yeah, that's difficult because um, just from a purely physical point of view, it it will take a toll. Huge, to to play chess and also to be pregnant. Huge. I mean, it, it just uh, just physically, it will be difficult. Of yeah. course, also you have to divide your attention um, between two. Like chess really benefits from not having to care about anything else. You know, I've thought about this. It's just when you don't have any worries in your life, it's easier to play chess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, also like Judith, for example, she, um, you know, she had like the most successful career you can imagine. And uh, and then she also, well, she is a, is a mother as well, but it's difficult to play chess at a top level while ha- being pregnant and having to deal with that. I don't know the timeline for her, like when it was, if she took a break from chess during those those years. I think yeah, yeah, recently is... she became a mom like um after no, 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 she no. retired right i think no it was retired, before it was before it was before okay okay yeah yeah i i visited her um her house in 2009 uh i think she she was just recently a mother then mm. and she retired in 2014 after during the, the olympiad Olympia. right yeah like the pretty in much right after the olympiad or maybe it was during the olympiad that she announced it um so but also you know it could have been completely unrelated she could have also thought I had a, a long and illustrious career and she wanted to pursue uh, something. I'm happy else. with everything I achieved, so I don't need to, you know, chess is also very difficult and stressful. People yeah. think that it's like, for example, Vichy. I mean, it's just unimaginable to me. The guy is in his mid 50s, still playing top tournaments. And the mental stress <laughs> of that is absolutely it's, incredible. It's, but he enjoys right. it, he enjoys it a lot. There, 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 there's something about Vichy and his career. He just, I think he's having a very difficult time. Uh, just not being in the routine of a chess player, not traveling tournaments every month. No, that's possible because you get used to it. It's you know for for someone who's only done that their entire life as a career. Yeah, it's like it's very difficult to adjust to not doing it. On the other hand, people who don't play chess professionally, they don't really think about the amount of stress that it takes, especially when you've played world championships, like Vichy has. He's played multiple world championships. I mean. He played against Gary in 95. Like we, we think about how long ago that was. 27 years ago, he played a world championship match against Gary. He played two against Magnus. Dude, I was four he years of age Brandon. at that point. <laughs> he was how old? I was four years of age. I mean, the guy has yeah, been were, has been around for a while. Uh, I mean, he played Kramnik. He played Topolov. He played Gelfand. Like how many world championship matches he played? I, I can say from experience how difficult one is. Yeah play half a dozen i mean it's it's completely insane um it's absolutely crazy it's also the reason why magnus didn't want to play like it's just a lot of stress and i, I still want to it's not only the stress right it's just the time expenditure 
um, the resources that you have to allocate, the relationships that you know you have to balance on the side while you get ready for a world championship match for six yeah. months of one of the years. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I have to say, if you're in a relationship at the time to convince your you know your significant other that I'm going to take three months off now to go hang out with some chess dudes and uh, look at you know <laughs> openings all day. It's not an easy thing to explain to someone. Um, it, it was extremely difficult for me um, and for Jen, my current, my fiance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Right now. It's, it's um, a very difficult thing from many points of view. So it takes a very special type of person to be able to do that, even when you no longer have to, because Vichy is like, he doesn't you know, have he's to made, he doesn't have to he's made more that. money than most people can dream of. Like, he doesn't need the money. He just does it for uh, either his enjoyment or maybe because he i think he just loves it his drive he, maybe his competitive he drive also it. just can't allow him not to be the best in the world um but also know. that's very interesting because he's still among the best which yeah, is yeah, absolutely like if at, ridiculous if we look at the rating list um he's still in he's the top 10 right now right he's number nine in the world um, unbelievable like the the people below him i'll just name some names karyakin <laughs> rajabov uh, Rapport. These are all guys who are, you know, under the age of like 35. Maxime, um, Vidit Duda, like, I, you know, these are young people. Dude, he's 52. Yeah, yeah he, okay. I, I, yeah, I said, I think he, I said he was mid 50s, of course. That's absolutely <laughs> crazy. It was wrong, but still, he's the only one in the top whatever that who, who's 50 in the top 50, right? Well, in the top 20, you only have one other player that just turned 40, and that is yeah, about. Everybody yeah. else is either in their 20s or 30s. Yeah, yeah. No, so I mean, it's, it's already very telling incredible. when we were talking about Nakamura's retirement years ago, and he's 34. People yeah. are talking about my retirement, and I'm 30. Uh, <laughs> Magnus literally retired from World Championship. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but he's 32. Like, yeah, yeah it's like, for example, Rajabov, people were talking about his retirement. Like, He is kind of retired, right? Well, he's also 11 in the world. I mean, what kind of retirement is that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. But people were talking about his retirement like eight years ago. So it's a, it's tough out there. Yeah, I mean, and now you see uh, Levon dropping below 27, whatever, 2740. I think for the first time in the last, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years or something like that. The same with MVL, 2747. Okay, they'll, they'll things back. are changing. You, you think they'll they will be back, be back yeah? Yeah. You think they will have a second win? I mean, I I definitely see MVL having a second win. I definitely see Levon as well. I think he has extra motivation right now. Um, no, I'll just tell you, uh, all these guys that people think are out, they'll be back. Th th they'll come back. Like Tamor was at some point like twenty six seventy. Huh. That's so a, that's he, he scored actually... plus one, <laughs> that's plus crazy. one in the right? That is crazy. Yeah, plus one. Okay, I mean, at some point he was on minus two, and nobody, everybody was questioning why he's uh, why he's there. And then um, he finished well, almost. Everyone qualified. was questioning. Everyone was questioning why anyone besides Jan is there. <laughs> but we saw Ding also somehow squeaked out. Yep. A world Championship match. So speaking yeah. of the World Championship match, um, I think it was just announced by Fide. The dates were just announced by Fide. Huh? Um, let's talk a little bit about that. It seems like that's going to be scheduled from uh, 7th of April through uh, the 30th. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit different than what we're used to. We're used to have it uh, in the second um, second half of the uh, year, usually in November. But this time early on in April, that's going to be interesting. And um, the location hasn't been announced yet. What we've heard so far is that it's going to be well there are some chances that mexico will get the bid um is that what yeah you, what i you heard that i heard that but i don't know i mean i heard like from jan some rumor about mexico i don't know if that's uh that's the case you know hmm. also it could be that maybe mexico is on the table maybe it's not you know things change all the time absolutely yeah of course the bid most likely hasn't been finalized yet um but yeah mexico would be sweet I mean, we're not very far from Mexico. It's uh, going to be super nice and sunny in Mexico. So I, I can definitely uh, see a vacation sometime in April. Are you thinking of going? Do you have any? I don't know. I haven't thought any about thoughts it. Thoughts about that? <laughs> I have not thought about it. To yeah. be honest, I, 
I don't uh, make too many plans outside of my own chess plane. And uh, okay, we'll we'll see. First, we'll see where it is, and then we can see if it's worth uh, worth going there. That's going to be definitely an interesting one. We're not going to make any predictions about the actual result because we have so many months ahead of ourselves to actually kind of gauge the situation uh, regarding that match. So that's going to be an interesting one. I saw a very interesting. Uh, graphic on Reddit. Shout out to uh, Reddit. Top 10 pick ratings for uh, Classical, Rapid, and uh, Blitz. And I see you were uh, number three in both the Classical and the Rapid, but you actually haven't cracked the Blitz section. I think it's time to change that, Fabi. Well, <laughs> there is a slight problem, which is at some point, like these ratings that people got, which were near 3,000, mm -hmm. I think we're near the start of when the rating, the Blitz and Rapid ratings were released. Yes. And if you look at the Blitz ratings now, like let's say I play a tournament with a bunch of guys who are at the top, like Maxime, who is 2771 now. So he's yes. about 200 points lower than his peak. Yes. Or Grishuk, 2763 like 150 points lower than his peak. It's not easy. You know, I would have to, to get a, a perform a, rating around 3000 or even like okay i could maybe crack top 10 but to get one of those top ratings you need to dominate the best blitz players in the world right now the highest is 2909 nakamura um which is stratospheric and magnus is 2830 mm -hmm. uh, like there's been some blitz rating deflation compared mm -hmm. to these like magnus lost 150 points from his peak right yeah so yeah uh, the same with my rapid my best, best rapid rating, 2858. It's a bit inflated because it was after a very good tournament. Uh, right now, the ratings, you can see the rapid ratings, they're deflated from those best periods. There are no 2900s anymore. Magnus the top is, is 2834, so like 40 rating points behind your peak. Yeah, there was definitely some inflation. And I think uh, these were basically publicized and these top ratings are kind of secured in the first month after they announced the ratings the rapid and blitz ratings and i, I think that magnus might have gotten might have gotten his rating after he was like playing ding in some match which he completely dominated in 2019 you know it might have not been 2019 it might have been 2017 i can't remember exactly but yeah he completely dominated um ding in a match so sometimes magnus goes on streaks and gets like this ridiculous um, these ridiculous ratings. Yeah, but, and by the way, I see a report actually in the rapid portion. He's uh, number three in the world right now. And I see a mm -hmm. nice Romanian flag next to uh, his name. Yeah. That's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, the Romanian team will be extremely good. Yes, we have a uh, Raport, Raport. Deac, Deac, um, yeah. and we have the established grandmasters yeah. of uh, Lupulescu and Perligras and uh, we used to have Nisipanu as well. Now he's representing Germany. I don't think he has any thoughts of returning to Romania, but I mean, that's an option and I would love to see him return to Romania with Nisipanu in the team. That would actually be a very decent team, uh, Olympic contenders. But- uh, so The interesting thing um, yes. in general about all the ratings lists is that we've seen deflation in all of them. Yes. And I don't know what the reason is for that, but maybe it's an equalization between guys who were established at the top and guys who are now like young, young up and coming players. So there's more like really good players in the pool. That could be a reason. There's more rating to share around. I don't know if there's some other reason, but you know, only two 2800s and um, a lot of guys traditionally lower than their peak ratings, like Wesley, like Anish, um, Grishuk, uh, obviously Levon and Maxime are two good examples of that too. That seems you like know. a very sensible theory. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> look at, again, we, we've been talking about the Indian players for so long, but we're talking about them because there's so many of them and they're so good and all of them are approaching or surpassing 2700. So, um, yeah, obviously there's way more players in the pool right now. And speaking of players surpassing 2700, Hans is actually playing a tournament in Spain right now. It's called uh, Lobregat open it's actually very very little publicized right now 
I think there's um, some rumors that a company in Spain bought the rights of uh, not only the TV rights, but also the transmission of the games, which is kind of crazy. I think we had a lawsuit about this um, a couple of cycles ago at the World Championship match when World Chess or whatever the company was at that point were trying to secure the rights of transmission. Then Chess24 sued them and won the lawsuit or something along those lines. So I thought that... Yeah. I think this has more or less been established. I'm not 100% sure what's happening here. I thought this was settled, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't don't own chess moves that are played in your tournament because... That was the case. This is not not stuff that's created. This is stuff that's discovered. All possible chess combinations of moves and chess games already exist in theory. I mean, you're not creating something from scratch. It's just the rules of the game, you know, have these possibilities. So you have trillions of... um, upon trillions of possible chess moves and games, but you can't create them. You just can only discover them. And to me, it makes sense. Like, how can you own some, like, let's say you own the game that I played in some tournament in Spain, because you, you know, you hosted the tournament and you sponsored the tournament, whatever. And you said, I own these chess moves. And then by complete coincidence, an exact replica of that game is played un- unknowingly between two other players. And actually it doesn't even have to be unknowingly. It could be um, just theory, right? There's a million games that have been repeated because they're become established theory, uh, like theoretical draws. We've seen the same, you know, Berlin draw like uh, two hundred thousand times, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. What, are you telling me that I'm cop- that I'm committing copyright infringement by playing the same game that's been played before? <laughs> like, well, well no, I, I, I think just... it's just about the names, uh, owning the, the 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 names that played that particular game and you can actually do that nowadays with nfts yeah but but the players can the same players can play the same game like nakamura and wesley have literally yes. played the same game yes. more than once yes on different websites yes they played the same berlin draw on chess.com and chess it's, it's, it's just that particular game like the game well, in that particular event at that particular date uh and moment in time and um yeah i mean i guess I guess he owned the game. But again, I, I thought this is already settled. And I think that's not, I thought that that was not a, the case anymore, that you can challenge that. Uh, but it seems like they're trying to do so. And maybe I don't have all the information, but it does seem like they're making it very, very difficult for chess.com and chess24 to actually transmit the games. With that being said. Also, wait, I'm looking at the name of this tournament. Is it yes. really E L L L O? Is that three L's? Uh, it, no, no, no. It's El Lobregat. Oh, they just put it together. Exactly. Okay, so it's El Lobregat open. open. Yes. El okay. Lobregat open. Okay. Okay. And I'm obviously mispronouncing because my Spanish has been taking a hit recently. But yes, it's uh, El Lobregat open. A lot of uh, very strong players actually. And Lobregat doesn't sound like Spanish though. It sounds like it could be some kind of Basque. Is this like in the Basque region? It could be. I'm an uncultured guy, so, you know, if... Is this like a city, Lobregat? It, it feels like... It. Ah, it's in Catalonia. That's still Spain. Yes, no, no, but uh, but uh, they could speak Catalan there, yeah? They probably do. So that's an interesting one, and Hans has been struggling to get over 2,700. He's been 2,699 for the last three events, which is actually kind of funny. And right now, after the first two rounds, it seems like... Uh, at least in the live rating lists, he's over 2,700. He won his first two rounds, and right now he will be playing Kacharava Nicolosi, who is actually from Georgia. And um, he's had a tremendous World Junior Championship. So Mm -hmm. um, that's, I, I don't think he won it. Actually, I know he didn't win it, but he was leading for the majority of the event. So definitely a very young up and coming player to watch. Uh, from Georgia, this is going to be a very interesting game. Uh, it's also I mean, good to see Vallejo making some sort I, of comeback. I think, like on the on the subject of Hans, yes, because I guess it is. It has been its own subject for a while. Mm-hmm. He has at least silenced the people who said like you can't play chess, and everything you achieved was through cheating. Mm. Because he has he's maintaining the twenty seven hundred rating with all possible eyes on him. That oh, this guy. Uh, is a cheater and yeah okay we have to admit he did cheat right he even admitted it yes but yes. he's still 2700 he's staying there that's it must feel good for him that he's saying that he's showing that even if he cheated in the past at least he is this level 
around 2700 whatever i mean i think that he has like an inflated view of his level he probably thinks he's more like 2750 but still 2700 is very good you know he's he, he is uh he's at least proving some of the haters wrong in that sense definitely definitely that is the case all right well i mean this is definitely going to be a tournament to follow big week coming up uh big couple of weeks actually coming up we have uh the gala we talked about that a little bit we have a lot of podcasts actually in person so i'm definitely looking forward to uh resuming those in person podcasts that's going to be a lot of fun and then we're going to la we're going to shoot a lot of content we're, we're connecting with a lot of interesting people so i'm looking forward yeah to I, I i'm very much excited about that first of all because like i know we've talked a lot about the chess boxing people probably think it's you know, it's coming it's coming trying to, <laughs> trying to create some content but i i actually am excited to watch the chess box of course box. Why wouldn't you be? I mean, come no, on. It, sound, it seems fun. I, I'll be enjoying it. I and Lawrence is very confident. He is. He's very, very confident about his his matchup. Um, he's been training which, a lot. He, he yeah, really so, has been training a lot. Actually, you you've been in contact with him a little bit, right? Yeah, we 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 spoke, and not very much, but uh, from what he said, he seemed very confident about his match. Which I, I know Lawrence well, and he's generally. Uh, very okay. So I have a story. I hope he'll like forgive me for for saying this, but I'm sure he'll be fine. So he was my manager uh, starting from 2014 until um, like mid 20. Uh, sorry. Oh no. Sorry. No. No. I'm, I'm, my dates are wrong. Right? No. Until uh, like mid to late 2016. In fact, 2016. closer to the end of 2016. And so once he visited me in Spain when I was living in Spain, he comes to me and he's like, "So what do you think about?" playing against me with rook odds. Uh, okay, you know, I'll probably lose, but probably lose very heavily, but like, why are you asking me? And then he explained that somehow a bet had emerged where Magnus had challenged him or someone had said like, I don't remember who where the challenge came from, but the bet was that Magnus and him would play Magnus with rook odds in blitz, no increment, uh, same, t same time control. I think it was like three minute blitz. And he had to get to six wins before Magnus got to four and so we played a few like training games. Oh, you actually like, trained with Rukat? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say training games. Like he he wanted to see if he would accept the bet. So <laughs> he was like, okay, you know, you're you know, maybe you're not Magnus, but you're a good uh, substitute for Magnus in the meantime. So I'll just try against you. And of course, he crushed me. He basically traded off pieces, and I was down a rook, and that was it. Like what? And Nine Lawrence is like, or like how many games did you guys play? I forget. It was like two, and I was like, this is dumb. I don't want to play with Rukats. Right. Um, and I, maybe I wasn't trying too hard either because I didn't particularly care, but I, I still think that this is like an unachievable challenge to play Obviously, yeah. a 2450 player. He's an international out. master. I mean, seriously. Like Lawrence, is, Lawrence is a good player. People underestimate that he is, he was close to the grandmaster title. Then he was like, okay, I'll take up this bet. I mean, you know, why not? Like if I can beat uh, Caruana, why can't I beat Magnus? The problem was that he didn't have, he didn't say like, okay, let's go to a hotel room Magnus and let's play this rook odds match and I'll take your thousand dollars which is about a thousand dollars straight up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, instead he play, decided to play in a club after a few drinks I remember that night yeah when you were you were there right I was okay I have a funny story about this as well but you continue your story you finish it and then I'll, I'll tell just my finish story. it up so he decided to play in the chess club in St. Louis after the tournament everyone wasted Maxime Bashir Le Brav especially wasted and he didn't realize the effect that this would have where people were just started heckling him as soon as the position got unclear and it got to his head because magnus doesn't care right i mean he has nothing to lose in this match he probably doesn't even care about the money right he just wants to like like magnus loves having these psychological things over people so magnus has nothing to lose and lawrence has everything to lose and once the pressure got on and it started to get a bit close and Magnus has, of course, that psychological edge over people that everyone knows about, that he gets into people's head. And Maxine is suddenly heckling Lawrence from the side, like, what the fuck are you doing, you <laughs> weak dumbass? Yes. And it all gets to Lawrence's head, and somehow Magnus wins this match. And I, I really hope that Lawrence forgives me telling the story, but it was very funny. And Lawrence actually like made the money back in some other bet that night. And it made it into the Norwegian press, which is especially funny. This actually made it to news. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, but yeah, it was it was very. 
I was really sad that he lost the bet, but it was also the most entertaining thing I've ever seen. Was he still your manager at that point? Yeah, yeah, 2015, Singfield Cup. Rustam was there too. Rustam was like playing straight up one minute over the board chess against Maxime, and Maxime was playing Grisha. They were all drunk. At some point, like Maxime and Alejandro uh, play 47 seconds against one minute, and I'm betting like $1,000 um, on this ridiculous, stupid game. Uh, which Alejandro kind of squeaks by and, and wins the game and, and uh, uh, saves Lawrence a lot of money. So this was like the end of the night. But um, but yeah, that was that was the night. That was fun. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was definitely a good night. And now I'll add on top of that because I, I do remember vividly that night because uh, also it was my first time at the club. Um, I think I was doing some journalist work for chess.com and not a lot of people knew who I was inside the club, like uh, the manager uh, of the chess campus, uh, Joy uh, Bray and Tony Rich and all of those people. And I only had like a press badge with me. And generally, if you're a grandmaster, you're probably going to be allowed to enter the club um but that particular night just because magnus was there and he was playing press wasn't allowed inside mm -hmm. uh, of the club also everybody as you just mentioned was pretty wasted so obviously you know joy bray the manager was trying to shield the grandmasters from uh potentially uh bad things uh being heard about them in press mm -hmm. so i entered um, and I think I entered just because, you know, I was a grandmaster and I was confident enough to, to, to enter the club. And some people knew me around there, obviously, Alejandro, you and everybody uh, around. But Joy didn't know me. Uh, and at some point she was like, hey, who are you? And I was like, I'm Grandmaster Christian Kirilla. I uh, was working for chess.com during the same field cup and she was like show me your badge uh sh show me your uh, show me your id and for whatever reason i didn't have my id with me and i couldn't show her anything and then she kicked me out of the club <laughs> and i was like are you kidding me i was so pissed and in the end uh, i i believe it was uh, alejandro who came out with joy and he was like yeah he's legit a grandmaster so we should probably I actually kind of remember this. I kind of remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She yep. kicked me out of the club. I mean, I'm harboring a lot of very, yeah, bad thoughts about about the club since then. No, obviously I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not harboring any resentment. I love the the Saint Louis Chess Club, but that was a fun night for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was. The, the, okay, we'll see. Lawrence is uh, he he likes to get into these these bets, these competitive, like, I'm sure he has some money, right? I don't know, of course, but like that he has some bet going on this with Amon, I wouldn't be surprised at all, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, Fabi, um, that was it for uh, this week. I think we covered a lot of things and uh, we'll resume next week. I'll see you in a few days in St. Louis. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, good to good to have you back. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll do some fun content soon. It'll be interesting. The chess boxing LA, the ga the galley here will try to get Judith if, uh, if possible. We'll turn uh, on the cameras and and we'll try to to get some uh, some fun conversations going. So looking forward to that. All right, cool. Cheers, guys. See you in the next video.